Awesome. Thank you, team, for leading us. Appreciate that, guys. How's everybody doing tonight so far? Doing all right. Luke's doing good. You getting enough sleep out there, Luke? Yes, sir. Good. How's Danica doing? Not as good? Yeah. Yeah, the baby has a greater need for Danica, no offense or anything, but right out of the gate. She's, she's got a need for Danica. Yeah. Um, welcome. If we haven't met yet, my name is Nick Mastrud, and uh, we're going to just jump right into it, but I'm just going to ask for your undivided attention for the next 15 to 20 minutes. And uh, what we're going to do after this, if you're new with us, I just want to keep you up to speed. We're going to process this stuff out loud because we believe like the, the bread and butter of this ministry isn't like what's spoken on stage, but it's what happens in your lives as you process things with your small group leader. So you're going to have a small group leader here tonight who could be doing a lot of other things, but they have answered the call to serve the Lord in, in the capacity of like sitting in a group with you guys and helping you process things. So if you get a chance tonight, thank them for what they do. They are outstanding. They're amazing. They are my heroes. Um, but if you have your Bible, whip that puppy out. If you have a phone and it has a Bible on it, whip it out if it's not going to be a distraction. If you know it's going to be a distraction, be self-disciplined and just kind of like sit on it or get it out of your sight so that it's not a temptation for you. But we are in week 12. Can you believe that? Luke, week 12, that's pretty crazy, right? Week 12 in the book of Acts, and we've been, we, what we've been seeing in this is the birth of the church. In the book of Acts, the birth of the church, last Sunday was actually the church's birthday. Isn't that crazy? Pentecost Sunday. How many of you guys were here on Sunday? A couple people. Yeah, wasn't that so legit? I was telling Dave that um, most people, if you grow up in our church, you're probably going to think that they spoke Spanish on Pentecost because we always have like Spanish and English. Um, but it's, it's not that far off. But anyways... Um, the early church were the original world changers, um, and that story reverberates and has reverberated throughout history to such an extent that we're sitting here today because of what happened in the story of Acts. And that story actually continues through you, through you and I that is continuing. Um, some, someone brought up recently that somebody that me and Luke were listening to, and they said something like this, whoever wants Gen Z most will have them. Whoever wants Gen Z most will have them. And it was kind of this charge for us to desire your guys' lives. And, and what they're saying is like, whether that be social media, they're, they're fighting for your attention, they're fighting for your life, whether that be trends, there's all sorts of trends and it's longing and, and, and looking for your loyalty, looking for your attention, whether that's politics or pornography or consumerism, whatever it may be, but I'm here to say tonight that, that I believe that Jesus wants you guys the most, that Jesus has paid your ransom, has given his life up for you because he wants you the most. And my hopes for this evening is that you would encounter Jesus in a way that causes you to long for him, that causes you to surrender your life, your, your desires, your will over to his will, that his will may be done. Um, in the passage this week, we're looking in Acts 23 and 24. And we're seeing a common theme for Paul and his ministry. And that theme is discouragement after discouragement. Anybody ever been discouraged out there before? Anybody ever been discouraged in 2020, particularly 2021? Yeah, amen, amen. Discouragement is inevitable in this fallen and broken world. And Paul is preaching and he sees tons of wins. There's a lot of achievements, a lot of really awesome things happening, a lot of really good responses to the gospel as he is saying like, man, you're, you, you have freedom in Christ, but he is seeing a lot of conflict and rejection to his messages and to him as a person. People are saying literally, I hate you, Paul, and we're going to try to hurt you physically. And if we aren't careful, any time of any type of adversary or rejection or anything like that can lead us to this temptation of wanting to toss in the towel. Ever just want, been so discouraged you just wanted to give up on something? So discouraged where you're like, it's just not working. Anybody ever been discouraged with math? I remember math homework in high school. I'm like, dude, I just don't get it. I'm just tossing in the towel. Discouragement. Rejection and discouragement are difficult times to walk through. But what we're looking at today is particularly discouragement when it comes to sharing the gospel. Discouragement. In, in the story today, Paul is discouraged. There is conflict going on between 
um, about who Paul is and who Jesus is. And this guy comes up, picture this, there's a conflict going. Picture I'm Paul for a second, there's, there's a conflict going on. And this dude randomly walks up and he goes, I want you to slap Paul in the face. I want you to slap him in the mouth. So imagine I'm really discouraged, like, ugh, and this dude's like, slap him for me. What Paul didn't know is that this dude that, that came up and said, I want you to slap him, was actually the leader. He was the high priest in that area. He was a very, very big deal. So keep in mind, Paul has no idea this guy is really, really important. So instead of just going like, holy smokes, this guy's a big deal, and he just instructed people to slap me upside the face. You know what I'm saying? Instead of doing that, instead of t getting the sign, you know, taking the hint and being quiet, Paul bursts out. In the midst of his discouragement, he goes, you know what, buddy? Instead of you slapping me in the face, God is going to slap you in the face. And then he goes on and insults this high priest, and he starts calling him a whitewashed wall, which is a really weird slam. <laughs> like, does anybody ever called you that before? If they did, that's really weird. But what that means is you're, is you're a hypocrite. He says you look all clean on the outside, but underneath that paint, you are, you are lacking integrity. Underneath, you are broken. And Paul calls him out for this and says, dude, you, you're saying that you follow the law and then you just instruct these people to slap me. You can find this in verses one through five in chapter 23. And Paul is discouraged and it starts showing up in the way he, he is acting. Have you ever been so discouraged that you just start acting out and you're like, I'm sorry, like been hangry or whatever it is for me. Luke even called me out for that. He's like, dude, hangry is like your Achilles heel. Like it just gets me every time but he's starting to make rash decisions and mistakes. Have you, ever, have you ever done something out of impulse and immediately regretted it? That is the, the situation that Paul is in right now. I remember in particular, this is just a fun story. There's this friend of me and Luke's, um, his name was Steven. Actually, we called him Harper, right? And we're in gym class and we're going into this new gym area and the, the teacher is gonna show us like, hey, these are the new equipment, this is how you use it. And first thing, he like runs over and like jumps on this piece of equipment. And uh, he's like, Harper! And he's like, shut up! Just kidding. So like out of impulse, he tells the teacher to shut up and then he realizes, oh my goodness. Well, he didn't say shut up, he said something else. But everybody's like, ugh. And he's like, I'm so sorry, 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 sorry. He like goes and jumps back in. But anyways, he's, Paul's on his wits end and he's like lashing out and he, he wishes he's not, but he's just so discouraged that that's what's happening. So the story goes on to explain that the audience is divided on what they think about Paul. And the Pharisees, the Pharisees believe that Paul is legit. They're like, I think that what he's saying is actually honest. We're kind of siding with Paul. And the, and the Sadducees are sketched out by him. They're like in conflict. And the argument got so heated and violent that it says this in Acts 23, verse 10. Go ahead and throw that verse up there. It says, and when, and when the dissension became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away from among them by force and bring him into the barracks. So Paul got to be at his wit's end. He just spoke out of turn and, and bashed this leader, made himself look like a fool. He's causing huge issues in just about every city he goes into. People are mad at him to the point of them needing to by force take Paul and hide him so that people don't shred him. Have you ever had a week where you were just like absolutely done with the week? You're like, it's Wednesday and I'm just done. I'm done with the week. Like, you're just like, dude, wake me up when it's Monday and I'm gonna start fresh on Monday. I can imagine Paul is so discouraged in this moment. He's, he's trying to be the world changer he's supposed to be. He's trying to do all the stuff he knows that he's called to, but it's met with hardship after hardship, after difficulty, after difficulty. And when sharing the gospel becomes difficult, it's easy to be discouraged and assume that it must not be of God. Have you ever done something hard and been like, it shouldn't be this hard? Shouldn't be this hard. We have this temptation at times to adopt a belief that looks like this right here on the screen. If it's difficult, maybe you can add confusion in there. Like, um, it's difficult. There's a situation, circumstance that's confusing. Honestly, I'm getting really tired. It's against culture. Like, I feel like I'm pushing it back, pushing against what seems really natural in the culture right now. Um, and it just doesn't, yeah, it doesn't feel natural. It doesn't feel like the current flow of what's going on around me. Then we equate that with it must not be from God. 
It must not be from God if it's hard, if it's difficult, if I'm tired, if it's confusing, if all these things, right? But my encouragement to you would be to remember this. Don't confuse difficulty as God's absence. Go ahead and throw that up there. Don't confuse difficulty as God not being present in that circumstance. Because what we're going to see is God was well, he was well present. He was, he was very tangibly present in this moment. It's in this moment of difficulty and exhaustion that something happened in Paul's life that picks him up. You ever need just like a, like a energy drink? or you, No, you don't. We're not going to go there. But you ever just need something to pick you up, like to just give you a new perspective? Like Paul is revived and he's replenished in a single moment. There was something that changed his perspective that lifted him up and gave him boldness to press on. Listen to what happens the night that he is like held captive so that people don't shred him. This is what the verse says in Acts 23, 11. The following night, he's in this barracks, he's scared, he's discouraged, he's bummed out. The following night, the Lord stood by him. He's having this dream, he's having this sense sense that God is near. He's having this vision, and it says this, the Lord stood by him and, and encouraged him. He said this, take courage. Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. Take courage. Be encouraged. Be filled with boldness, because what you are doing is exactly what I need you to keep doing, and not only are you going to continue to do it here, you're going to continue to do it where I send you next. Today, we are talking about courage, and I want to start off by saying this. When circumstances are challenging, we can take courage, not because God will take the circumstance away, but because we know he is with us in the circumstance. He is in the fire with us. He's in the difficulty with us. He's not going to abandon us. We can take courage and press on through difficult circumstances when we know that God is with us. When, when Paul is at his lowest, Jesus shows up in the form of a dream, whatever it might have been, to remind him that what he is doing is the thing that he is being called to. That even though it's hard, he is where he needs to be. Maybe that's the lesson you need to hear. Even though you're in a difficult scenario right now, it's where God needs you to be right now. Be encouraged. Take courage. He, Paul is infused with courage. I pray that that is something that happens for you today, that you are infused with boldness. And I'm going to take make uh, four quick points about courage and the role that it plays in followers of Jesus, okay? If you have your notebooks, note takers are, yes, so take some notes. I want to start like this. First point is this, courage has always been the mark of a Christian. Courage has always marked or been an identifier of Christians. The Bible is chock full of men and women who have supernatural bravery in the presence of insane circumstances. We see this all throughout the Old Testament. We see that Moses finds courage to face his past mistakes. We see that David finds courage to face like impossible situations. You guys know David? You know what he did? Killed this giant, right? Esther finds courage. You can throw this up on the screen, bro. Um, Esther finds courage to take a huge risk. Daniel finds courage to, to not give in or to sell out to the culture that's like vying for his attention. Um, check out what just in the book of Acts, where, when the word boldness or courage like comes up. It's a staple throughout the early church, the early, the first world changer series ever. They always talk about boldness. Right here in Acts 13, we're going to zip through these, but in Antioch and Pisidia, Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly when the Jews publicly reviled them. Next verse, 14.3, in Iconium, they were also vigorously opposed so they remained for a long time speaking boldly for the lord next verse in ephesus apollos spoke boldly in the synagogue next in ephesus paul taught in the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly luke taught on this and reasoned and persuaded them about the kingdom of god next verse in caesarea when paul was in prison he spoke boldly to agrippa Pro yeah, yeah, one more. Proclaiming the kingdom of God and, and, and teaching the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Um, and then this last one in Acts 28, 
Oh, nope, that was the last one. No boldness. But I could give you a list. So this is, it's just saying, like, they were bold. They stepped up. They had courage. They were bold. They were bold. They were bold. I could give you a list of hundreds of early church people who were bold to the point of death. They were martyrs for the faith. Um, Boldness and courage are no doubt something that has set God-honoring people apart from the rest of the world. The second point I want to make is this. Courage comes from the Lord. Courage, where is it? Is it me just being like, come on, be bold. Just do it. No, it comes, there's a source. There's a, there's a place that it, you receive that. And in, in this story in Acts, the Lord literally showed up and infused Paul with courage. It was from the Lord. That's what encouragement means. So you know what courage, encourage, it means to put courage in someone. When I encourage you, I infuse you with courage. If you're lacking courage, it's found on the other side of an encounter with Jesus. Lacking courage, find yourself at the foot of the cross. When you abide in the giver of courage, of true courage, of true bravery and boldness, then that is the fruit. Hang out with Jesus and you will become bold. When you know that he is for you, he is for you, then it, and nothing can compete with that. When you know that he made you and he relates with you, when you know he has a plan and a purpose for you, when you know he laid himself down to rescue you personally, you can't go about life with confidence. You, you, you have all the confidence in the world going about life knowing that God is there with you, leading you, guiding you. The source of courage is in the Lord. If you don't believe me, I just want to encourage you, <laughs> infuse you with courage and say, try it. Try it. We, can only be con- we cannot be confident in only ourselves. It's found in the Lord. Listen to what Hebrews 13, 6 says. It says, So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear, what can man do to me? This, I love this posture right here. This is sheer trust and confidence in the Lord. When he is for us, when the loving God of the universe is on our side, what can hurt us? What can come near us? You might say, that's really cute, Nick, but for real though, people are brutal. They say things that actually do hurt my feelings and they can actually do stuff that, do, that does harm me physically like they were doing to Paul. But we take courage knowing that the battle that we are facing, it might affect us physically, right? But our hope is in the keeper and the sustainer of our soul. That's what matters. Like we aren't in a battle against flesh and blood. It's so much bigger than that. It's so much bigger than that. There is a battle for your heart and your soul. And when Jesus is the protector of your innermost being, there is nothing that we have to fear. Nothing. Take courage, Cedar Mill youth. Be bold, be courageous in the Lord. Seek him and and courage will be the byproduct. Third is this. Courage is contagious. Courage is contagious. Probably a weird time to use that word, (laughs) but it probably just hits a little different because, yeah. Philippians 1.14, listen to this. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. I love that. This is Paul. He's in prison, and he's saying people are actually stepping up, and they're, they're much more bold to speak the word because they've seen that I've been put into chains for it. They see my life and they're like, they caught the, it was contagious. They caught whatever Paul had and they're like, I'm going to do it too. Paul's imprisonment and boldness for Christ was contagious. And we've all experienced this in some way. Like we know what it's like to be scared of something, but we would be a little bit more brave if somebody just went ahead and did it first, right? Maybe you've done like some cliff jumping or something and you say something like, dude, I'll do it if you do it or you go first and then I will. And then they jump in and you're like, woo! I'll totally do it. And then you're still scared and you don't do it. Maybe that's just me. But anyways, um, did you know, though, that you could start a domino effect of courage in this group right here? Do you know you could do that? The best way to start a movement of courageous faith is to make the decision to step out in faith. If you want to see this group become one of the most courageous groups you've ever seen, it starts with you. This youth group could be one story one act of faith away from igniting a boldness fire among this crew. How crazy is that? Like, what if building a courageous and brave youth community started with you, your decision? It started with you stepping up and confessing a struggle, saying, you know what, I need help with this. 
And I'm gonna be bold enough to say that in this group. Or maybe it's you sharing your story, like I've been through this and God was with me and he never left me. What have you been through? Like how can, how can God encourage you in this moment? Or maybe it's you choosing, it's you being bold and stepping up and saying, I'm gonna put my reputation on the line to invite that kid to youth that, that nobody ever wants to talk to. People might not wanna hang out with me here, but I'm gonna be bold. Or you're stepping out of what's comfortable to make sure somebody else is seen in this youth group. What if your act of faith ignited something that affected our whole community? Let me just say this, we need your boldness. We need your boldness. We need your courage, because courage is contagious. And fourth is this, courage is our witness to the world. Courage is one of the ways that we witness and we point towards who God is. Our courage in difficult times show the world what kind of God we serve. When we trust in the Lord and develop confidence, it's a light to the world that shows that he is trustworthy. He is trustworthy. You are safe in his protection. I was reading some content from uh, Campbell Morgan, and I can attest that this has been true in my own life. This is so true for me. Listen to what he says. He says, all our fear and all our panic result from a dimmed vision of the Lord and a dimmed awareness of Christ. There is no refuge for the soul of man other than the Lord Christ. When you find courage in the Lord, when he is the source of your boldness, it leaves people wondering where the heck your refuge is. Where does that person hang out? How, what is the source that they're connected to? It leaves people aching for this soul level confidence that you have. When you have this confidence in self, when you have this confidence in self and you're like, not in the Lord, but in self, and you're like, me, 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 like, look what I can do, look what I've done, look, look what I've done on my own power, it's a soon-to-be fleeting reality. We're only so legit on our own. I can tell you that as a fact. We aren't confident in what we have done. We're confident in what Christ has done, and that just hits different. People notice that. People notice that. We aren't confident in who we are. We are confident in who Christ is and who he calls us to. Let's backtrack for a second. Acts 4, 13. It's one of my favorite verses right here. I love this. It says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and and perceived that they were uneducated, so they're like, they they haven't been to school. You know, that's kind of like Baker. You know, usually people are like, you went to school at Baker, didn't you? But they were common men. The people were astonished. They were astonished at who the heck Peter and John were, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Isn't that crazy? It's like people that have never gotten a college education, you talk to them, and it's like, dude, it looks like you've been in school for years. The boldness of Peter and John, the courage they had, it astonished people. World changers astonish people by their courage, not because they're confident in themselves, they have no confidence in themselves. They, they are uneducated. They have nothing to lean on. They, they weren't overly impressive on their own accord. Their confidence was in Christ and him alone. And the result is that people were pointed towards Jesus. They go, I know Luke isn't that legit on his own. It, what, what have you been doing? Like, I want what he's on, you know? And you're like, the Lord, okay? People were blown away and they were left wondering about Jesus. I was this, reading this article from Angela parrot. And this is what she said in her article on courage. She said, there is something truly beautiful, inviting, and compelling about a person who has been with Jesus. A person who has been with Jesus is empowered by his Holy Spirit and given courage to walk in bold faith and confident assurance. That person is convinced Jesus is who he said he is, and he can do what he said he can do. Notice this type of courage. It doesn't point to self. It points beyond self. It leaves people thinking there is no way that that person is the way that they are on their own. What is their secret sauce? What's their secret sauce? Well, it's time with Jesus. Your secret sauce to confidence in the Lord is time with Jesus. In communication, on our knees seeking him, coming to youth, praying for an encounter with him that he might shift your perspective, and then going into this world and replicating the heart of Jesus to the people in your schools you want, to, you want the world to know Jesus? If you want the world to know Jesus, spend time with Jesus and people will witness him through you. They'll get a taste of Jesus through your life. Your courage is your witness. Angela goes on to say this. I, liked, I had to put this in here too. She said, 
But we should not think every time boldness is required, we will feel some heroic swell of confidence like, la, da, 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 da. no, God often gives us spirit-empowered boldness when, in spite of feeling fear, like, I'm still terrified, God, but we step out in faith that the Spirit will provide the measure of boldness we need in that moment. Sometimes we might feel this deep sense of fear. There's, there's nothing wrong with feeling, feeling fear, right? But in that moment, when we choose to have faith, the Spirit will provide us with the level of boldness that we, meet, that we need, and that is reliance on Jesus. Let's start wrapping up a little bit. I found this article that asked youth students from around the world, so these are world changers, but in different parts of the world, okay, about what it looks like, what around, around the world about having a, a courageous faith. What, so what is a courageous faith to you? What is a bold faith to you? And I wanna read some of their responses because they were super inspiring. This is um, Juliana Law from the Ukraine. This is what she said. When I have bold faith, I step boldly into something that I cannot accomplish in my own strength. I'm putting myself in a complete dependence where if God doesn't show up, I am in trouble. It is being willing to be in over my head, completely surrendered and utterly dependent. It is knowing that God's goodness is unchanging no matter what the outcome. It is praising God now as if it has already been accomplished. Isn't that posture so rad? I want to meet Juliana. She seems super, super faithful. Um, Scott Movar from the Croatia, listen to what he said. He said, for me, bold faith is being willing to put my hands up like Isaiah and say, here I am, Lord, send me. Even if you know, even if you know that that decision will bring into question everything people know about you. The boldest faith decision I've had to face caused people around me to question not only my decision making, but their own. <laughs> I love that. My bold faith has caused many moments of feeling alone and unsupported by even those closest to me. And yet I can look back at those same decisions and know that they were the very best expressions of bold faith and obedience to God. In response to these students, I want to give you the small group questions that we're going to be discussing right up front. I want to set you up for the discussion that you're going to have directly after this, right out of the gate. And then I want you to jump into these questions when we're going to have a few other things, but I want you to jump right into these questions because I want you to be bold tonight with some of your responses. But here are some of the questions that we're going to be wrestling with. What would a brave, courageous, confident in the Lord version of yourself do today? If you were like, man, if I really relied on Jesus to come through what would that look like for you? Another way to put it, this is just another way to phrase it, is what would you do if you were confident and certain that God was with you? If he was, he was like supporting you and he was gonna help this come to fruition, how would you respond? Another question is what fears are holding you back from pursuing Jesus more, more fully? Let's identify those things so that we can bring him to the Lord and say, man, I want my courage in you to be greater than the fear that is not of you. And then the last one here is, what is a bold prayer you need to pray this week? It says, we, we see this story in scripture, you, you, you don't have because you do not ask. We, we go to the, to the door, Jesus' door, and we knock, and we say, Jesus, and we ask boldly to the Lord because we, we believe, that's the kind of faith we have. We're, we're bold believers in Christ, so we're gonna, we're gonna pray bold prayers. And then finally, this is a challenge to be thinking about what this looks like for you specifically. Put yourself in a circumstance where Jesus has to come through. This is kind of what Juliana Law said in her, her quote, like, man, I have no other, th like, if God doesn't come through, I'm done for. Like, put yourself in a situation where you have to rely on him and then trust God to come through and see how he does it. But remember, circumstances might not turn out as they as you may expect like it's not gonna be like this 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 and this but he will always use it for his good when you choose to latch on to him and when you choose to trust him and be bold in jesus name and i want to conclude with this prayer it's from francis drake i love his name he's this english sailor who followed jesus in the 1500s and he came to know the lord and i think this beautifully calls us into deeper trust in the lord and would you pray this with me? Let's pray this, and then we're going to move on to what we have next. He says, Disturb us, Lord, when we are too well pleased with ourselves, when our dreams have come true because we have dreamed too little, when we arrive safely because we sailed too close to the shore. 
Disturb us, Lord, when, when with the abundance of things we possess, we have lost our thirst for the waters of life. Having fallen in love with life, we have ceased to dream of eternity. And in our efforts to build a new earth, we have allowed our vision of the new heaven to dim. Disturb us, Lord, to dare more boldly, to venture on wider seas, where storms will show your mastery, where losing sight of land we shall find the stars. We ask you to push back the horizons of our hope, hopes and to push us into the future in strength and courage and hope and love. This we ask in the name of our captain, who is Jesus Christ. God, we offer tonight to you, we ask that you would just infuse our youth community with boldness. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and offer this discussion that's going to happen after this. Amen.